driver's side window in. Uh, passenger side, not so much. <laughs> they sent us the wrong window, uh, which is really handy because it's pissing down the rain for the next week. So uh, hopefully we'll be here tomorrow. Didn't see you there. Today I'm going to be working out the charging system for the leisure battery. Now as you know with an electric vehicle there is already charging ports installed and I'm trying to figure out a way to utilize these rather than put a mains inlet around the side. Now I've seen a few different setups online obviously it's quite a new technology and not many people have done conversions of these vans. One of the craziest setups I saw somebody had a mains inlet down the side of the van that would charge the leisure battery, then they had an inverter going off the leisure battery, and from the inverter was a plug socket installed here, and they would use what's called a granny cable, which is a three pin normal household cable, plugged into there, and then it would come out and it would have one of these type one chargers on the end that could then charge the vehicle at the same time. It looked utterly mental. I'm not even sure that's safe to be honest, <laughs> but it was done by a legitimate company, so I don't know, they must have done some research, but it just seems nuts. Um, so what I'm hoping to do is to be able to turn up at a campsite with a normal campsite hookup cable, a type one cable like this on the other end, I will plug it in here, just like this, and it will charge the traction battery as well as the leisure battery at the same time. To do that, I'm gonna use what's called a DC to DC charger. It's basically a charger that sits in between the van's starter battery. It's gonna sit between that and our 12 volt leisure battery at the back, and it's going to charge between the two and also allow you to charge the traction battery at the same time. But I need to find out whether this 12 volt starter battery um, is going to charge when I'm hooked up. So let's go and test it. 12.34, it's kind of about halfway charged. So I'll put it on charge now and hopefully we should get a reading of about 13, 14 volts. Hey, look at that. So that's 14.28 volts, which does indicate that the van is charging the 12 volt starter battery when it's charging the traction battery, which is good news for us. So that effectively means then, when we're at a campsite, um, we can charge everything all at once if we've got the battery to battery charger installed. Who knows why people are doing all these crazy things? I don't know. <laughs> are we missing something? Maybe this is gonna go horribly wrong. seats for the NV200 and the ENV200. There's not a specific one made here in the UK, um, so you have to adapt it a bit. So just to clarify then, these two bolt holes already existed in the base here. Just had to create these two as new holes and I've now just um, bolted them down and just pulled these cables through. So there's actually no seat runners um, on the passenger seat. So we bought these from a scrapyard for, for a tenner, but we need to make a few modifications to allow it to actually swivel. So we're gonna lock this bit off here, these two little brackets that are now redundant, and then we're gonna also do a few cuts around these edges to allow it to turn without it hitting the plastic trim on the side of the door.
Okay, with this all locked in place, I can show you the swivel base in action. And you can see why we've cut this corner off the runners on both sides. As you can see, it's now just missing contact with the driver, uh, sorry, the passenger side door. Happy days. Okay, so now that we've created some holes, uh, we're going to pass some conduit through and this is just going to protect our cabling. So what I'm going to do is just follow my design of where everything's going. I'm going to be running up switches around here, you know, we've got USB sockets heading around the other side, we've got inverters, etc. Uh, so it's just a case now of feeding all the cabling through the conduit and then we'll hook it all up towards the end of the build. Yeah, yeah, keep going. He's poked his head out. He's so beautiful. It's a boy. I'm about to go and screw the floor into place. Um, before doing so, we really need to check what's underneath here. Now, I don't know if you can pick up on that, but this is where the battery sits. So I'm gonna be aiming for about here, and I've gone underneath, sort of reference this here as the point on which it's 100% clear, and then I can go ahead and put a couple of screws along there. All the electrics are now done. So basically everything's gonna be switched up here. On the other side of this switch unit is going to be um, two switches, one for the solar panel and one for the battery to battery charger. And the reason we're putting those in is if we are driving along and our range is getting quite low, we could then switch the battery to battery charger off and it's going to save a, a little bit of the range um, so that you know if we're really struggling we can actually get to a charging point without sort of sacrificing some of that range to charge our leisure battery. We basically just left little sticky notes on everything to tell us exactly where it's all going. Really good to double check all of this stuff to make sure all the wires are in. The one good thing about conduit is you can always pull in an extra cable if you do find there's something missing. With all the electrics in and the floor base in I'm going to make a start on the battening. As you can see I've curved this piece of timber, that means I've just cut these little lines all the way down it and that's just helping it bend because there is a little bit of a bow. Yesterday, the heat was pretty brutal. We've just woken up this morning and it's lovely and cool outside. Uh, feels like it's gonna rain shortly. But there's this lovely bird song going on. But yeah, I thought it'd be a nice morning to uh, make a start on the floor anyway. So I've taken the plywood base out and I'm gonna use this to scribe round and basically act as a template for the flooring that's going on top of it. So we'll clamp those on, scribe round it, cut it out, should be good to go.
say you're floored by it, Buffy? Playful by it. And that's no oak, is it? Uh. <laughs> <laughs> this door arrived from the breakers. It was in pretty good nick. We're just repairing this little bit here. Um, we've got the final window in at last. And we can also shut it and actually lock it for the first time since we bought it. I'm going to I'll do a few of these panels here on each of the door. There's four of these to be done. And instead of just guesstimating what the uh, template is, we can repurpose these. So if you've got some of these, do keep them. So now all I've got to do is draw around that and follow it around the jigsaw. What are you up to now then, Beth? Uh, I'm just painting some white paint on there so then we can put some tape across. So once the tape's across, we can paint it all green and then reveal and hopefully a nice line with some mountain design. Buffy? Peeling day. Peeling day. Can we see what looks like? Yeah, go on then. Uh, I'm scared. <laughs> Ooh, that line looks pretty crisp, Buffy. Ooh. Ooh, it looks really good. Ooh, it's looking all white. It's looking all white. Wow, that looks really cool. Hey, that's all right, isn't it? I'm pretty pleased with that. That looks really cool. Hey, Faye. Um. <laughs> Interesting technique you got there, Buffy. So I'm being very delicate. <laughs> I do know how to use a sander. <laughs>
That looks so cool. That look all right? Yeah, it looks amazing. Can everybody see it from here? Well done, Jelly. Okay. <laughs> So, we're having a right laugh today, aren't we, Buffy? Oh, yeah. Been pissing down the rain, but Buffy's keeping the spirits high! <laughs> today, we are working on the kitchen unit. Mm. The difficulty is trying to fit everything together. So, we want our sink, and um, we need some water storage for that, and the wastewater is going to exit out of the bottom. <laughs> uh, we've got a little bit of storage here, and then we've got a pull-out fridge, uh, which is on its way. We've got this induction hob, which arrived. Uh, as well as a very small amount of storage for the plates and pots and pans. So it's a case of trying to fit this all in and then working on how this is all going to be divided up. We also want to pull out table and some sockets um, and maybe a little hidden spice rack. That's kind of the little, what do you call that? The vibe. Not the vibe, but the... Joe's signature <laughs> dish. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> We've had difficulty trying to fit the sockets and that little spice rack in without it taking too much room out of the sliding door when you walk in and out, so figure those little bits out and we'll get it all cut up and made. And then Buffy, tell me your woes. So my woes are that the kitchen unit is just too tall. It looks ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> chopper chopper. Hi. Yeah, it looks less ridiculous. Okay, so now we've screwed up all the timber frame, we need to fill the pocket holes. So I'm doing that with these plugs. Um, so what I'll do is I'll pop a bit of glue around and then push them into the hole. And then later when they've dried, we can sand them all off. Mm, slight problem. Can't seem to find the cables. Uh -oh. Let's try this. Oh, I feel something. Oh, Christ.
continue and it's um, getting there, but we need to do the worktop next. The only trouble is it is massive and it weighs a ton. So we're trying to cut it down on the uh, table saw because we don't have a bandsaw. So with this method, the problem is we've got this middle section here, so we have to manually saw it in half. That's what she said. <laughs> <laughs> so, would you like me to help? Yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> I got one more to go. Oh. Standing for you there, Buffy. <laughs> <laughs> Little bit of standing, eh? <laughs> So I'm just about ready to sand these joints now and um, before I do I just want to try and get rid of some of these slight gaps around the joints um, previously I've used some filler um, the oak filler though that I've used before gave a very orangey tone um, and it didn't look very natural so one of the things I've started doing recently is applying some glue in here wiping it right into the joints um, and then before it's had time to dry I then take a sander to it and some of that fine oak dust actually gets caught up within the glue within the joints and gives a much more natural seamless finish.
right, so we're kind of coming towards the final stages of um, finishing the van, um, and I've been thinking a little bit more about the final fix of the electrics. So the change we're going to make is we're actually going to add a mains inlet down the side of the van here. Now there's two reasons for doing that. Um, firstly, I was a little bit concerned that the induction hob is going to use up a ton of power. Um, so if we rocked up at a campsite, say it's 6, 7 p.m., uh, we want to get cooking, have some dinner, you look at the leisure battery and it's not got that much charge, we could be waiting a little while if we were to plug in here. Now this is going to be charging three different batteries. So that charge is going to go into the traction battery, the starter battery, the leisure battery. Um, so you could be there getting a little bit hungry, a little bit frustrated, a little bit hangry. If we've got a mains inlet here, what it can do is automatically prioritise the shore power, so the mains hookup. Um, so those plug sockets are going to be ready to go straight away and it's going to be charging the leisure battery whilst you wait as well. So the second reason, this being a new technology, I'm just a little concerned that some campsite owners might be a little cautious about people plugging in the front here. Um, now I completely understand if we're charging the traction battery and the leisure battery that's going to draw a lot of power, it's going to cost them a lot of money, um, but they may also have concerns that it's going to trip the fuse box as well. So one thing that should help mitigate tripping a campsite fuse box is this vehicle charging cable which is designed specifically for campsite hookup. On one end it has your standard commando hookup cable and on the other a type 1 charger. Now the cool thing about this is it has a variable output which means that the power draw can be dialed down all the way to just 8 amps if need be, meaning that the draw can be set well within the campsite's limitations. Also if you remember I was talking a little earlier about that mad setup where someone had installed a mains plug socket at the front of the van. Well, it turns out this wasn't so crazy after all. After a little bit of research, I discovered some campsite owners will only allow you to charge the van's traction battery overnight through your own electrics, therefore tripping your own fuse box and not theirs in the event of a fault. So with this socket installed, we can then plug what's dubbed as a granny charging cable, which has a standard three pin cable on one end and a type one charger on the other. This will then allow us to charge overnight and will trip our fuse box and not theirs in the event of a fault. The really cool thing about this is because we're installing an inverter, which allows us to use these 230 volt plug sockets when we're off grid, we could actually charge the van's traction battery from the leisure battery. That means therefore, in the event that the traction battery has run out of charge and we need to get to a charging point and we're a few miles away, we could plug this cable in, the traction battery would begin charging from the leisure battery and it would just give us those extra few miles to get to that charging point. Technically, the solar panel is actually charging the leisure battery. So in a really dire situation, the solar panel could top up the leisure battery, which could then top up that traction battery, which is pretty cool. The other great thing about this cable is it can also be used at home and places that don't have a charging point already installed. And we also realise it's a great opportunity to take the induction hob outside and enjoy cooking in the great outdoors. Now to power these pretty energy intensive items, we needed a really decent battery for the job. So we chose a 230 amp hour lithium leisure battery. The particular one we chose was made by a company called Fogstar and I chose them because I was really impressed with what they had to offer at their price point. Um, as standard, their batteries include Bluetooth, so you can see how the charge is faring via an app on your phone. They've got a self heating function, uh, which is great because most lithium leisure batteries can't charge below zero degrees, but all of these can as standard and they all have built in battery management systems, which protects them from being over or under charged. Now, the longevity of these batteries is assured by a massive 10 year warranty, which should mean that we should never have to replace this battery. If anyone's interested in finding a little bit more about these cables and about these batteries as well, I'll leave a link in the description. But for now, let's get back into the build. <laughs>
god, oh god. Ah! Oh no! Oh, the bollocks. It's because you got to bend this part of the grain. And you got to bend here as well. Balls. So we're doing, going for a different tactic now. We've actually cut the top off. So hopefully, with there being less wood, it'll be thinner and easier to bend. Then we'll just have to plonk something else on top. Why does this not want to work? Okay. This seems to be holding though. Yeah. You can see all down here, that metal banding is just helping prevent the back from splitting. And obviously all these clamps are going to hold it in place for about a day. Fingers crossed when we take it out. It'll be nice and curvy. very back where there's that sort of curved bit I'd like to have a little feature bit just in the middle that's going to replicate um, that sort of mountain design that we have on the panel on the rear doors it's going to be woodworking in miniature form now Baby, get to fix the panel in place. Right, let's pause it there just as I'm winding Beth up. Um, at this point, I'm actually making a switch panel. And just like the floor trim, I wanted to make something that was curvy and a little bit more interesting. So we cut some timber down, put it in the steam box. I grabbed my compadre here and we clamped and we straddled and did our uttermost best to try and get this timber to fit that shape. Sadly, it brought very little success, so we actually opted for this. Mega clamp. Yes, mega clamp. We're supposed to clamp that timber together to help us get that shape, but sadly, this didn't work either. So we opted for something else. We're now going to be using this. Woo! Flexible plywood. What's really cool about this is the, um, the grain is all going in one direction. So normal plywood, normally all the layers are, are sort of glued up with one having the grain going that way, one with the grain going that direction, and that creates that sort of structural rigidity. With this, the grain is all going in one direction, Beffy's favourite band, and now <laughs> favourite flexible plywood. Now the great thing about this is obviously it gave us a ton more time to actually work with the material, unlike uh, steam bending, which gives you about 45 seconds to a minute. So as you can see, we could just easily put it into the former here. Um, we left it to dry overnight with a couple of layers on top and the results were, were pretty decent. Ooh. It's gonna look cool, that little shape up there. Mm. 
I know that was a bit of a faff, but... <laughs> It's easier than the steam bending. It was, yeah. <laughs> God damn. Well, everyone who's watching, you can save yourself days of work. Because <laughs> I'm just doing this. <laughs> So as we'd finally managed to get this to work, uh, we were then able to make the final pieces, um, piece everything together, um, paint it, oil it, and then we were ready to go ahead and install it. Oh, come on, Bethy. Don't tell me you're not excited about the panel going in place. Right, so I'm going to make a bit of a start on this bird's nest. These large cables, I'm going to use a lug so I can slide that into place like so. Um, now I don't have a ratchet tool as such for this, which you can get at sort of a larger version of these thicker cables. I've got one of these. You basically place the lug in there and I'm going to whack it quite hard with a hammer in order to get a crimp that's going to hold it on. It's going to be very faffy because it's suspended in the air. I should have done this earlier before I fed the wire through. So as you can see it's sort of compressed this part of the lug. I just lightly tug that and you can see that that's going nowhere so that's crimped on correctly and I want to put a piece of um, heat shrink on that looks something like this and then I'm going to get a heat gun you could probably use a hair dryer or something like that if you don't have a heat gun just to warm that up and it will cause it to shrink Now you should be able to see there, we've got a lovely insulated battery terminal. I'm going to have some smaller cables such as this one. And that's going to be for a lot of our smaller 12 volt stuff like our lights and things like that. And we use a little crimp terminal for these. It looks something like that. I'll go over the top, but first we need to strip the wire. And I'm going to use one of these sort of ratchet style wire strippers. So I can just push that all the way up to the red block there. And then just put it. I'm just going to twist that end got sort of like a more of an automatic crimping tool here so I'm gonna pop this into the corresponding color pop our cable into that little blue crimping terminal and I just want to compress it all the way until the tool releases and there we have it give it a light sort of tug but you can see that's now been compressed and crimped and there's our terminal
Um, so for the kitchen frame, you probably saw that we used some pine and then some really thin plywood to box each of the sections off. But for the bed frame here, we're actually going to use this 18mm ply. Um, now the reason we didn't use this before was purely for the weight. Um, we don't want to reduce any of the range that the van has got. Um, we've got all these different rails for drawers, etc. And they need a lot of sort of structural points to be attached to. So it was a lot easier in this instance to use this 18mm plywood instead. Um, fortunately, it's not that tall, so hopefully it won't add too much weight and not affect the range too much. This is the very top of the bed frame, um, as it would be when it's in situ. Um, we've got these three compartments here, each are going to be used for storage. This is the front face of our bed frame, so there'll be two drawers here. This will have a false drawer front on. The reason being that middle drawer there is going to have all the electric stored in it, so we'll have our 12 volt battery, all our wiring is going to be coming through here, and our inverter fuses. Um, the induction hub will be here at the very top, and then we'll have a little storage drawer underneath that and we'll also have a storage drawer down this end as well. Now you can probably see here there's a little bit of a lip and that's just to prevent our cushions from disappearing off over the sides. And you can probably see that this has kind of got a much deeper set to it uh, than this back bit here. And the reason being is we're gonna create a slat system now um, that's been way more complicated than it needs to be. But the reason being is that we want it to be able to lift up and also to pull out Obviously we want it to pull out so it goes the full width of the bed and makes more room, but we want it to lift up so that if we need to do any maintenance to the electrics, it's, it's going to be easy enough to do so. So that's what we're working on next. So at this point, we're actually coming towards the end of the build and I was working on a few different odd jobs. Here specifically, I was working on the legs for the bed frame. So they're just going to thread in and I've just added these little rubber feet just to give it a grippy texture to help prevent it from moving around. Next, I was working on the base for the dining table. We're using a biscuit jointer here to join everything together as well as some glue. Um, I wanted to create kind of an Aztec design for this. Um, and make something a bit different um, but we obviously needed that base to work from in the first place so I left that to dry overnight and then cut and installed these little bits of wooden trim in the meantime just to cover up those kind of difficult exposed areas that are present in the van and then we went inside 
and we did a little bit of painting of the bed frame and started making the cushions. Looking good, Bethy? Thank you. Last coat. Last coat. That's honey. Because I'm just about to make a start on the cushions uh, with my assistant Louis here. He's already making himself quite comfortable. <laughs> so we're going to cut four in total. And this has sort of firm density to it, which is ideal for camper cushions if you're looking to buy some foam for yourself. So I'm going to cut these to size next and then I can go ahead and make the cushion covers. Alrighty, so next I'm going to use some of this spray adhesive um, just to adhere some of this wadding on top of our foam. Uh, this is just going to soften up some of these edges. Um, but also it's going to just fill it out a little bit so that when we put the cushion cover over the top um, we're going to get a nice um, full finish rather than the cover being quite loose. So when I'm cutting the bottom plate for example, which I'm doing now, um, I've taken the actual dimensions of, say, the length of the foam, which was 92.5 centimetres, but then I've taken an eighth of an inch, or three millimetres, on all four sides of this bottom plate. And again, this is just going to help tighten up that cushion cover and make sure that it's not sitting loose. Once that's cut, I then fold the bottom plate in half, like so, and then I just cut a little notch halfway along. So you'll have one on all four sides, and I'm going to do the same on the top plate. And this is just going to help me align the two plates together later when we come to sew it. And the material of choice, um, it's kind of got this kind of grippy texture to it, uh, which is ideal just to stop it from moving about too much when the camper's in transit. Now that's done, I'm just going to go ahead and sew in the zip. So this is our top plate fabric, it's got a very subtle chevron pattern inside, it's really hard wearing, it's really suitable for upholstery. This centrepiece here is obviously the foam itself. These side bits are obviously going to be wrapped around um, and we gauge the size of these by the thickness of the foam itself. Minus uh, one eighth of an inch, as I mentioned before when I was doing the bottom plate. So our foam is four inch thick. So I've taken an eighth of an inch off there. We've got a three and seven eighths of an inch uh, distance between here and here.
So we're just about to put the tiles in, and uh, they look a bit enormous and ridiculous, don't they, Buffy? Yeah, a little bit big. So what was your suggestion? Cutting them. Cutting them. And look at these wee tiny tiles. So, cut them all into quarters, so they should look something like that instead. <laughs> so cute. So we've hit a slight snag in that the leisure battery is slightly too tall for the bed frame. So we're just going to route out a little bit of the floor here um, just to sit it a little bit lower. So I can't believe we're finally here but I'm actually about to do the final fix of the electrics which is rather exciting. So just a quick note on installing any DC to DC chargers or solar charge controllers. Generally you do need to set them up um, for the battery type that you have. So I've got to play with this here on this DC to DC charger to set it up to work with lithium. Here just above the inverter and this is where I'm going to install the solar charge controller and the fuse boxes etc. I've just made a few marks um, just around each component. I'm going to go and route some slots on those marks. Um, that's going to mean that the cables can come through and it's going to look really clean and tidy uh, when it comes to finishing all of this final fix off. Something's gonna blow up. So, do I just press it? Yep. Oh, what's that beep? 
What's the fridge? Oh! Wow! I've unplugged the mains inlet so this socket is now running solely off the inverter. Um, what's going to happen is an error will show up on the socket tester now. So you've got the green and the red light suggesting that the live and the neutral have been reversed. Um, this is completely normal, there's a floating earth inside the inverter so it presents as an issue um, but it isn't. Um, so just be aware of that. Um, just check that when you plug the mains inlet in that everything is kosher on here though. what it was going to be. 15 minutes ago Beth asked me how much it would cost to get someone else to do this. What do you think, Joe? Yeah, it's all right, Murphy. Just glad it's done. <laughs> <laughs> Serve a beer. Yes. Yeah, Well, thank you so much everyone for sticking with us and watching. I hope it's given you a little bit of insight into the process of building your own camper and given some of you a little bit of confidence to try it for yourselves. We love to hear about people's builds and where it's taken them on their travels. So do feel free to send us a message or drop us a comment under this video. And of course, if you have any questions about your own build, do feel free to let us know. I'd love to help and answer them. But for now, I'll leave a link in the description for the full tour and happy travels. We hope to see you on another conversion soon.